welcome to the Managing Violence Podcast, the internet's leading free resource on violence prevention, threat assessment, personal security, and self-protection, brought to you by R2S Violence Prevention. We are hashtag for the protectors. I'm your host, Joe Saunders. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Managing Violence Podcast. Today, I'm going to be joined by Mike Roach. Mike is a near 40-year veteran of law enforcement in the United States, uh, 26 of those years spent in the Secret Service, and has also authored a book on mass killers, uh, which we'll be talking about, uh, which is sadly topical and continues to remain topical. But before we get into Mike, I just want to mention that if you are in the United States, and especially if you are going to the Global Security Exchange in Atlanta, so it's the GSX conference in Atlanta on September 12 through 14. I will be there. So if you want to catch up with me, if you want to see my session, I'm speaking at 10 a.m. That's 10 hundred hours uh, in Atlanta on Monday the 12th. I am the first session on day one. Uh, just have a look at your program for whatever room number I will be in, but I will be in Atlanta and presenting on customer-initiated violence. So if you are in the security industry and you want to go see that, I highly, highly recommend checking out the GSX, the Global Security Exchange, at the World Congress Center in Atlanta, Georgia. I look forward to meeting with as many of you as I possibly can. I will have some copies of my book, uh, and I'm going to be hanging out for three days, uh, and actually a few more days afterwards as well in Atlanta. So if you're around, please make sure you come say hi. All right, I'm going to jump straight into the interview. Here we are with Mike Roach. Welcome back to the Managing Violence podcast. It has been a minute since our last episode, but I am absolutely thrilled today to be joined by Mike Roach. Mike is a highly experienced law enforcement officer with uh, over 40 years of experience, including 26 of those years in the US Secret Service. Uh, He's also written several books. Uh, One of those books that we'll be talking about today is Mass Killers, How You Can Identify Workplace, School or Public Killers Before They Strike. Uh, it's it's a book that uh, is sadly timely, uh, but it, but it has been timely many times over. So uh, I'm hoping that we can have a very detailed conversation about uh, some of Mike's learnings from the threat assessment, threat management, uh, and investigations that he has carried out. But Mike, thank you very much, and welcome to the show. Oh, Joe, it's it's actually, I mean, it's my great honor to to be on here. Like I said, I've been a fan of the show for a long time, and. Uh, when you reached out and asked me if I, you know, come on, I was just uh, extremely humbled and honored uh, knowing that the parade of esteemed guests that you had on there in the past. I, I, I call myself a student of life, and the day I stop learning is the day I stop living, and um, you were always pushing out great content, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, I very much appreciate the kind words, and uh Whenever everyone says that, I always just say, well, look, I, I, I've done very little other than just ask questions. <laughs> it's the, it's, no, but you have great insight, too. So, um, you know, appreciate that. I appreciate that. So, Mark, look, this this uh, this could be a very heavy conversation, but I think uh, g- given the people that actually listen to this show, I think we're, we're probably not uh, not a, not afraid of heavy conversations. But uh, Talk us through just a little bit about uh, your career and your interest in mass killers, active shooters. How did that start become an area of fascination for you? Yeah, so um, I started out um, a long time ago, um, many decades ago, um, with uh, as a patrol officer in the Little Rock, Arkansas Police Department. And for those that aren't aware Arkansas is kind of in the middle of the country, just above Texas. Texas is a border state. Um, it's the, uh, it was at one point the most violent small city in America. And uh, for 200,000 population, they just had their 51st homicide. So it kind of gives you an insight of, you know, uh, the, the working conditions. And, and it was a great place to, to learn how to interact with people and, um, and dealing with uh, violence. And um, after about 10 years, I left there and uh, had a short stay with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, and then um, moved on to the Secret Service where I did a total of 26 years there. And um, I I bounced around from uh, New Orleans to uh, 
uh, Miami to Washington, D.C., to Tampa, back to Miami again. So, um, But um, I would say my, my real interest uh, came when I was assigned to Washington, D.C. Um, I was assigned to the Protective Intelligence Division, and uh, that was right at the time, if uh, you viewers are uh, aware, of the, the National Threat Assessment Center that was just starting to... to uh, that they were conducting their research. They hadn't been formally uh, established yet, but um, they had uh, conducted the exceptional case study program, which was analyzing the, um, the those that were intended on uh, targeted violence towards um, our political uh, figures. So uh, I became intrigued with that. And then uh, shortly thereafter, I went out on a, uh, a trip with President Clinton to, uh, to Oregon, and uh, we visited the site of a, uh, a school shooting in um, just outside of Eugene, Oregon. It was actually in Springfield. And, um, you know, as I sat there, I, I was looking at this small school and the small cafeteria and with the beautiful majestic mountains. And, and I just sat there and I wondered what would possess, a, a, you know, a, a young student to, to go in and start gunning down his fellow classmates. And this was after he had already killed his parents. And um, from that, I just, you know, became very uh, intrigued by, uh, you know, conducting threat assessments. And that, that became the focus of the, the remainder of my career. So it's, uh, it's, it's probably something that we can uh, just quickly unpack for those that maybe aren't familiar with uh, the U.S. law enforcement environment. Uh, I think a lot of us, especially outside of America, see the the Secret Service as just being the the president's protection detail, uh, and and maybe aren't aware of all the other things the Secret Service are involved in, and all the other activities and, uh, and parts of the Secret Service. Do you just want to quickly, I guess, just a thirty second sort of snapshot of some of the things that you're involved with in your career in the Secret Service, just for context. Yeah, sure. So uh, obviously, most people are familiar with the fact that we protect the president, vice president and uh, visiting foreign dignitaries. So, um, you know, the heads of state from Australia, New Zealand and whatnot, when they come in, uh, the Secret Service would provide protection for them as well. And then we also conduct, uh, you know, investigation, cr criminal investigations of threats against our protectees, as well as uh, uh, investigation of counterfeit currency. Um, uh, cyber crimes, um, financial fraud, uh, all of that as well. Yeah. All right. So, look, let's. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going. I'm not going to dance around the elephant in the room, especially as a as a non-American looking in uh, at, at the U.S. Uh, it's such a complicated picture, but in 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 terms of looking at uh, the the number of shootings, uh, the the active shooter threat. Um, this and every American loves having an Australian comment on gun culture. Uh, so <laughs> I won't do that. Um, but uh, look, it, it is a it's a complex problem to solve. Uh, it's it's not as simple as oh we do you just need gun laws. Now that, that doesn't necessarily solve it when there's so many firearms already in circulation. Um, you know, I I've, I've been on the record before and said while I'm. I, I'm pleased that uh, that Australia enacted the gun laws that we did at the time that we did. Uh, I don't. Uh, uh, if I was if I was living in the U.S. right now, I think I would probably be licensed and carrying most of the time, even though I'm I'm pleased I don't have to here. Mm -hmm. uh, just being just being cognizant of the threat. So uh, so with that in mind, uh, going deeper than uh, just proliferation of firearms. What is it that makes the, in your opinion, what is it that makes the U.S. A, a bit of an outlier in terms of volume and severity of these these incidents? Not to say they don't happen elsewhere, but certainly the volume is is pronounced in the U.S. Yeah, so I mean, and like you said, Joe, it's, it is a, a very complex situation, and obviously the um, you know there is the availability of of firearms as well. Um, you know, which are always, you know, an efficient means of, uh, of killing people. And, um, you know, the, the one thing I always say too, is that, you know, and again, I'm not a, a big gun person. I mean, I carried one because, you know, that was a tool of my trade. Um, but, um, you know, we've also seen situations where, uh, most of us have, you know, a two or 3000 pound vehicle, you know, potential weapon parked in the driveway as well. 
And we saw that certainly in the, the, the Christmas parade. Uh, and then just recently, uh, this past weekend, there was uh, another individual that in Pennsylvania ran into a, a charity event and killed one person. And, and we're seeing that more often uh, overseas as well. Um, so I think if you take all the weapons away, there's still, you know, we, we saw the, the, the Boston bombers as well uh, utilized uh, pressure cooker bombs. The, uh, the, the Columbine, uh, that was uh, really a, a tragedy that was averted in the fact that uh, they had a significant propane bomb uh, set up in the cafeteria expecting to explode. And by their estimates, there would have been somewhere around 500 students in that, uh, in the, uh, that the cafeteria at that time. Fortunately, a malfunction and didn't go off. So, um, you know, it, it's just sadly has become part of the, the the culture here that you know what again a lot of them are on the cusp of uh, of looking to commit suicide, and uh, that they look at that and decide you know um, I, I'm just going to try to you know instead of in the past maybe you know going sitting in their car and you know, in the garage and letting it run or going into the closet and killing themselves, uh, they now decide, hey, I, I want to make a statement about my life. I want people to remember me. I want to put uh, an exclamation mark after my name so people are going to remember and I'm going to take as many people with me as I, as I can. And uh, th this is, you know, sadly become, you know, part of our culture and uh, it's uh, a, a sad testimony. Mm. I, I'm glad that you you raised those points because part what I don't want to do is start the interview with everyone who's not American going well that doesn't happen to, in my country and therefore this isn't really relevant to me. Uh, Australians that are listening now uh, who make up about last I checked about thirteen percent of the audience, but uh, we just had a potential active shooter event at a, at a Canberra airport, so a national <laughs> airport uh, where. Um, Thankfully, it didn't appear there was any intent to cause injury, but we had a, a uh, allegedly a 63-year-old man who walked into the airport, sat in the check-in area, uh, and then uh, calmly pulled a pistol from his, uh, an, an illegally owned pistol from his backpack and fired at least five rounds into glass panels before he was apprehended. Uh, so unclear as to yet, this has happened over the weekend, so unclear as yet as to what the motives were or what his intentions were, but... It, it does go to show that despite the, the gun laws and the controls and the fact that it's not common here, there's a potential that that could have been a mass casualty incident. Uh, we've had uh, random stabbings over the quote unquote random stabbings. You and I know they're very seldom actually random, uh, but um, we've had those those sorts of attacks. We've had vehicle borne attacks. We've all over the world. We've seen people that have been at their wits end or have decided to, as you say, uh, commit suicide in a in a blaze of glory and have found ways to take other people with them. Uh, and uh, and that, that is something that, that we have to be mindful of. And we'll talk about some of the motivations and some of the, some of the things that, that, that may be warning signs. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned just then was uh, a suicidal ideation or uh, actually being suicidal as a prerequisite for, for these attacks. Uh, and it's something that um, a couple of years ago, I forget where I actually was, was talking about this, but um, that the most dangerous criminal is one who doesn't actually intend to get away with their crime. Right? So uh, that that certainly changes the risk profile because you can plan a lot more things when you don't have to have an escape plan. Uh, Correct. And uh, and especially if the end goal is suicide by cop or suicide before the before the police arrive, uh, then uh, that's that's very very difficult for a from a response point of view to be able to really do anything about that. Uh, and uh, and I think that's probably where I'd like to steer the conversation. There's a lot of conversation around response and whether we have armed security or whether we need to have armed teachers or whether we need to have yeah, people people with guns on site to stop these things from happening. And uh, there's there's an argument for that. But again, response is so limited and it's, it's going to come usually after there's already been a casualty. So what are the things we should be doing to prevent this? And, uh, and that's a really big question. So I'll focus a little bit and say, what are some of the behavioral warning signs that you've noticed from all your investigations or your, your research that uh, everyday citizens should be looking out for? Okay. So um, first I want to uh, say the one thing there that you brought up was that 
um, so often we're focused on the, the reactive nature, but, um, you know, and my philosophy always is, hey, once the uh, the shots are fired and the 911 calls are made, it's too late. Uh, people are going to die. People are going to get hurt. And uh, that the idea is to try to stop that beforehand. And, uh, you know, recently I had made a similar statement in a LinkedIn forum and somebody came back and posted a picture of um, this bulletproof classroom and, you know, some of the... Uh, uh, security enhancements that they could do in that classroom and shutters coming down and all that. And I said, you know, that, gee, that looks great. I don't know what the expenses, you know, in order to, uh, to, to put that into to play, but what happens if, you know, considering that 90% of the school shootings are committed by students, what happens if the student is actually sitting in that classroom um, and pulls the gun out of his waistband and starts shooting? then that classroom is, um, you know, neutralized at that point. But so I always look at, um, you know, security is, is a layered approach, as you well know. And I look at threat assessments as being kind of the smoke alarm. It is the, uh, the, the first layer of security where uh, hopefully you can identify somebody that is displaying concerning behaviors, uh, address that individual, uh, find out what the problems are, how far they've progressed down the so-called pathway to violence. And if you can find a, um, a so-called exit ramp for them to exit off of that pathway and, and mitigate that violence and stop it before it ever happens. And I know we've been successful numerous times and rarely does that ever get publicized. Um, obviously, you know, that the mistakes are the ones that land up on the front page of, you know, uh, every, you know, newspaper and uh, every news program. But and and they, they have to be called out because sadly, there have been some horrific failings. Um, you know, we can look at, you know, say the, uh, Parkland, uh, Florida, uh, at the uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas uh, High School there in that situation. Here you had a student that had been uh, interviewed by the police or the police had co been called to his house 43 separate times. And they, inter that they interacted with him 21 times. Now, you would hope that somewhere along the way, one of those deputies might have said, hey, listen, you, you know, I'm really concerned about this person's behavior and I'd like to... Um, direct them to the threat management unit for additional follow-up. But the only problem was the sheriff's department didn't have a threat management unit at that time. They do now, but, um, you know, we spend a, a great deal of money, you know, and most police academies will teach them how to uh, um, respond to a, an active shooter event, you know, and this is how you're going to go in. This is going to have how you stack. And we saw, you know, obviously failures at Parkland and in Uvalde as well. But I don't think much time is focused during the police academies in dealing with, you know, arming the police officers with, hey, these are the skills you need. And these are the warning signs you should be looking for. And, um, you know, when we're talking about warning signs, over 80% of these individuals have what we refer to as leakage. And that is the easiest way for us to identify, you know, uh, problems. And almost after every one of these incidents, we'll hear from sometimes it's members of the community. Uh, sometimes it's uh, people that were on social media with these individuals. They say, oh, yeah, he was saying this or he was saying that and making these threats, very concerning statements. And, um, you know, it's kind of surprising that, you know, especially in social media, they can uh, moderate, um, you know, content based on what you're putting up there concerning COVID or certain uh, political races and whatnot. But they seem to be um, uh, having difficulty trying to uh, identify this type of language. And, and again, we don't know what we don't know, and we have to rely on the community to, to report these types of behaviors to, to, to individuals. And uh, so many of these people, um, and please jump in at any time there, Joe, I don't want to keep going on a, a long. 
Actually, I, I would I would just pause there just because there was yeah. something you said about uh, I think leakage is such an important uh, topic from a a general citizen's point of view. We all have contact with people in our lives that there there'll be people whether whether it's professionally or in your family or whoever that you're like oh, if anyone that I know was ever going to do something bad it'd be that person right we, we all right. We have that person in our lives and hopefully that's always they're they're kind of just a minimal outlier not a massive outlier but um. One of the things that uh, I think social media has amplified for us, and it could be an argument as to social media ex accelerating the the number of mass casualty events we've had, is that often when people voice a desire, they're kind of just putting it out there to see what the response is. And if there's one positive response to what they've their, their voiced, that validates the whole idea for them uh, if they're already on the fence about it. And I'm thinking about uh, the Christchurch mosque shooting that we had a, a few years ago, in, in mm -hmm. where uh, this yeah, offender had um, publicly stated his intentions uh, on uh, 4chan, I think it was, off memory, uh, and literally was encouraged by people uh, on the on that forum, who I'm certain most of the people that responded in a favourable way or in a laughing way or in a we're not expecting him to follow through. It was, it was, it was banter. It was, um, yeah, like they, they, so, so many random weirdos on the internet, you know, whatever, like it's, it's, it's victimless to encourage this. But if you're in the mindset where you're considering whether or not you're going to go ahead and do this and one person says, yeah, do it. That's a, that's a great idea. Uh, that's, that's all you need. That's a green light now because we all want some sort of social validation. Uh, and uh, I think that is such a, powerful thing to think about like when it doesn't even have to be about mass killings right um domestic violence or i'm gonna rob a bank or i'm gonna yeah i'm gonna steal that car and, oh yeah go on do it and all of a sudden like oh, holy shit my friend's stealing a car uh, that, that, that kind of thing we have to be so careful of that but coming back to leakage uh i've, I've talked to so many teachers over the years um sorry I just got a uh, I just got a uh, notification that our meeting was ending in ten minutes. I'm not quite sure why that is. Mm. If we get booted off, Mike, uh, yeah, to, to edit myself, uh, I will I will send you a new link. Uh, okay, I'll do it via LinkedIn just to get that just instant message across over to you. Okay, I'm on LinkedIn. You said, yeah, yeah. I'll just I'll send you a new Zoom link if we get kicked off. I'm not sure. Maybe Zoom have just changed their terms or con their conditions. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so, so coming, coming back to, to leakage, I've spoken to a lot of teachers that have expressed concerns about a, a child's mental health, about their, their well-being, their upbringing, their family life, etc. Uh, and certainly in the literature that I've read around, around school shootings in the US, oftentimes the student who did it was not a surprise to the teachers. So what do we need to have in place to allow those teachers to be able to speak up? Uh, and what stops them from speaking up from, from your experience? Yeah, so I, I think so often, and uh, we had one I know in California where uh, in uh, Santee, California, where even two adults had overheard him making statements of what his plans were. And, um, you know, so often people sit there and say, oh, I don't think he really means it. I don't think he's going to do it. Or, you know, in uh, a couple of instances where they actually confront them and they say, oh, I was just joking. I didn't mean it. And, you know, th that's the, the end of it. And there's no further action taken. Uh, we saw with the, the Columbine, um, one of the students there uh, wrote um, a, a pretty um, significant essay that pretty much he imposed himself into the, the role of the character of this essay that he had written and goes on a, a mass killing of what he described as perps. And, you um, so the, the teacher was uh, significantly um, alarmed by this and, and called him in. And in fact, her statement was, it was probably the most uh, violent imagery she had ever read. And again, coming from a senior teacher, that, that states a lot. And she confronted him about it and he says, oh, it was just a story, I didn't mean anything by it. But then she brought it up to his parents and um, she didn't actually have the essay in front of her, but you know, the parents kind of said, well, you know, um, 
uh, we'll, we'll look into it and, you know, have somebody call us if there's any follow up. And and there's uh, no evidence to suggest that, you know, that the parents did have any discussions. Perhaps they did. I, I, I know you and I both, if we get a notice from uh, the school teacher that our children had written what they termed, you know, violent imagery that they were concerned about, that we would have gone home and gotten under the hood there to examine, hey, what's going on? Where are you? Why are you writing like this? And, you know, some people can chalk it off and say, you know, even Stephen King, you could probably look at some of his high school writings. And, you know, they were probably very disturbed as well. In fact, that the book Rage um, is talks about a school shooting and, you um, you know, he started that when he was in high school. It was very well written for somebody in high school, but, uh, you know, it's, it's one that uh, several of the uh, school shooters uh, or school killers uh, actually had read themselves. In fact, then Stephen King had the book removed uh, from circulation. Yeah, I think it's, it's not just limited to teachers as well. I mean, it, anywhere that people may leak, I guess, uh, as some of <laughs> Had this conversation uh, before about uh, faith leaders. Um, you know, at, at what point do you does your your bond to not say anything become like? Well, if I don't say something, this might actually visit me here. Uh, we've you know, I talked to a lot of pastors that have heard some pretty some pretty scary stuff. Like I'm I'm thinking about killing my wife. You know, uh, help, help me with this. Like at some point we need to escalate that. But then the other side of it is, well, I don't. This, they're a good person. They're going through a hard time. I don't want them to be arrested. And I think sometimes that fear of what the response will be when I raise that question, am I going to ruin their life because they, they trusted me with something? Uh, and I think certainly for, from a teacher's point of view, talking about a 14 year old kid that's had a really rough upbringing, I don't want them to you know, go on some watch list for the rest of their life and you know, be arrested at gunpoint in my class. Or there's all this sort of fear about what the, what the heavy handed response will be. Uh, and I, I just wonder whether there's a, more education required about some of the other response options so that teachers, faith leaders, friends, whoever, parents feel more comfortable bringing it up without fear of the consequence. Um, and I'm sure that's something we've, we've evolved in terms of the the sophistication of our response, but that whether that's been messaged out or not is, uh, is a question. Yeah. I, you know, to me, we have a duty to warn and, you know, th there's no way that I want to be sitting you know, uh, having the knowledge that I knew that this person was, was uh, in deep despair and was, you know, making statements that were concerning, and that I chose not to say anything and just dismissed it. And, um, you know, I mean, there, it, not everybody that you report has to be arrested and, and jailed. And in fact, I would always say that uh, incarceration is actually the, the last measure that you use. And trying to find, you know, in the event if they're going through some, you know, financial issues, perhaps, you know, credit counseling, you, you know, can be called in. Uh, you know, you work in, in workplace violence. Uh, you know, the um, uh, employee assistance program is is always a wealth of information, be able to, to tap into different resources, you know, anger management, uh, mental health, uh, therapy, um, you know, sometimes they need uh, housing assistance. Uh, marriage counseling. I mean, there's all kinds of, and, and especially in, in uh, uh, faith-based uh, incidents, they are already plugged into that kind of community where they can tap into all, you know, all kinds of resources that they have at their disposal. So they don't necessarily have to, um, you know, I, I think it has to be documented and, you know, depending on the, the level of concern, whether you notify the police or not. And, um, you know, sadly, sometimes we see that, you know, that the police come, uh, especially here in the States, they're, they're underfunded and uh, overworked. And, um, you know, they've got calls in queue waiting to be uh, responding and that they don't really have the time to, to work these cases like, you know, probably should in some instances. And the dispatcher or their sergeant or lieutenant are calling them, telling them, hey, we need you to get, you know, 10 8 so you can get another call. Um, so, um, for, you know, we, again, a lot of times, uh, police officers will, and we saw this with the, uh, the Buffalo shooting where, uh, they took him in and dropped him off for a mental health evaluation where he had made a, a threat the previous year to school. 
And, um, you know, he was quickly evaluated and then released. And this is the, the problem that we face. And um, with um, uh, a lot of the, the, the circumstances, uh, you know, especially with COVID, uh, I think a lot of parents looked at, hey, you know, the, the, the kids on the computer, he's, you know, uh, under the roof here. How much trouble could he be getting into? And, um, you know, in that case, you know, he became radicalized as a, as a result. And uh, I know that there was one investigation I was involved in where uh, the, the child was living with uh, his grandparents. And obviously there had been some trauma in his background. But uh, when he uh, you know, as far as they were concerned, they were church going folks and he was upstairs in their bedroom. And they didn't think he was getting into any trouble. Well, what they didn't realize was that he was assembling, uh, you know, uh, suppressors or silencers, whatever you want to call them and firing him, firing a handgun into uh, telephone books. And then he had, um, you know, research at the school had a map of the school up on the wall and the, the windows were blacked out and all that. So, and he was you know, planning on conducting a, a, a school attack. Um, but, you know, grandma and grandpa had no indication that anything was amiss. And, um, you know, it, it takes the engagement of parents sometimes to, to really see, hey, what's going on in their lives? And, um, you know, I think um, you had previously talked about the, um, um, the, 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 there was a book that came out recently, uh, oh, the, um, the violence project. And, you know, I think in that book, they had expressed a sentiment that, you know, sometimes, um, you know, an active, you know, a random act of kindness can, can change somebody from uh, going on a path of violence that all of a sudden they find somebody that actually says hello to them and smiles and, and provides them some reassurance that day that it can make a difference in that person's life that day. Yeah, that that um that random act of kindness is a it, it's it's a nice sort of uh thing to think about like what what difference does every interaction make with somebody um one of the things i, I would like to explore is, as well we talked about the, the suicidal ideation the search for meaning and uh, glory significance etc uh i did a research project uh, maybe a year ago about uh, the psychological tools used by terrorism recruiters uh, and and what they look for psychologically for someone they're trying to recruit to to an act of, you know, or to to perform an act of violence and, uh, and and seldom is it the true believers that are the ones that are actually blowing things up. It's the sad, lonely, isolated kids that are looking for some sort of meaning in their life and some sort of respect and some sort of you know, overall significance. Uh, and I, I think they're they're sometimes a uh, in hindsight, it's close to a sympathetic figure as you can get uh, it, when, it, when it comes to someone who's murdered a lot of people. Uh, but um, I'd like to just explore some of the other motivations that, that we've seen. So we, we've seen some that are, that are based upon racial hatred. We've seen some that were based upon you know, a domestic violence situation that escalated or that, that ended up just encapsulating everybody around it. So what are the other some of the, some of the common motives that you've seen uh, that have led to a mass killing? So, uh, and you're exactly right uh, when it comes to, again, the radicalization and hate is that uh, sometimes they're, they're looking for vulnerable people, uh, the thugs and losers, as I, I refer to them in the book, um, that, um, you know, are looking for some, you know, and, and it's the same philosophy of uh, street gangs. You know, they're, they're looking for somebody that's vulnerable. And at the same time, that person is looking for some acceptance in life you know they're they're not getting it at home they're not getting it from society and this becomes their you know proxy family so to speak and um, like you said that uh, rarely are they true believers in that but uh this is the cause that they're raising their their flag about and you know it, it provides a certain level of importance to them but you know um most of these folks have all um, are in, you know, serious despair. You know, uh, things are not going well for them in life. Um, if you look at, you know, for an adult, for example, you know, perhaps they've just been, you know, terminated from their job. Their uh, spouse has left them. 
uh, in bankruptcy, the house is in foreclosure. They decide to go down to the liquor store to, you know, drown themselves in misery, but find out the car has been towed out of the driveway. And then they walk back in only to find their goldfish has died as well. So, I mean, it's just one thing on top of another, and they just can't seem to get a break. And, and I refer to that as the emotional negative vortex because it, you know, it's been described to me by these individuals I've interviewed is that you know, they feel like, you know, that they're circulating, you know, uh, going around the drain, their entire life is being sucked down. And for adolescents, their frame of reference is much different. And you'll see that, you know, for them, they may sit there and say, hey, I failed my geometry test last week. I didn't get the job at the grocery store. And my girlfriend of two days just broke up with me. You know, so, you know, for us as adults, we look at that and say, oh, that's nothing, kid. Don't worry about it. But for that kid. No, don't worry, kid. That, it's worse. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and, how, you know, how, you know, it, how often is that our reassurance, though? Like, oh, oh, you think it's bad now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's going to help. And that's why I always say when you're interviewing these individuals, you, you really have to, you know, stand in their flip flops, so to speak and look at life from their perspective not yours but from their perspective and and see you know the amount of despair that they're going through and um you know quite often they're you know they're depressed uh that they feel like they've been victimized by society or you know by the employer that they were working for uh that the boss was out to get them they never had a chance uh they rarely will take responsibility for their own actions uh, uh, wound collectors, you know, they uh, were grievance collectors, whatever you want to call them. Um, you know, I remember the um, the, the former um, Los Angeles police officer, uh, Christopher Dorner. So uh, he was able to go back and, you know, recite in his manifesto that um, in the first grade was his first perceived uh, racial animus that he had, had incurred. Well, you know, I mean, that may have been a very significant event for him, but from that point forward, he cataloged every single grievance that he ever had in his life and, uh, you know, was always, you know, pretty much a failure in, in everything he tried to do. Um, and, um, you know, as a result, you know, he blamed everybody else. He never took any responsibility for his, his own actions. And, um you'll see that, you know, a lot of these individuals are, um, you know, significantly depressed. And I think you've discussed, you know, the uh, warning signs of, of suicide, but, you know, depression is one of those mental illnesses that's uh, probably the most easily concealed. And, uh, you know, we've seen, you know, comedians, you know, uh, Robin Williams that committed suicide, you know, probably one of the funniest men on earth. And, uh, you know, sometimes you don't know what's really going on behind that facade. Yeah, you mentioned before that the destabilizing factors of someone losing their job or a relationship breakdown and so on. Um, that, that's something that we, uh, I think we, we all have, a, have an obligation just to keep an eye on people in our lives because you don't know if someone was just holding things together just because this one last thing hadn't happened yet. Uh, and now all of a sudden everything that's happened in the last month has been compounded by this last event, especially if it's something really significant, like like a job loss, like a relationship breakdown, like a yeah, a death of a family member, uh, and it's something that we we all are in a position we we're all connected on social media now. You all see when someone's had a bad thing happen, and you all see when someone has vented publicly, and then there's reactions of your heart emoji, or alternatively, just ignore it because ugh, I'm not going <laughs> to. Uh, Oh, you're venting about your relationship on Facebook, but like these could be warning signs that something's going to happen. And uh, I think a lot of us that are quote unquote psychologically normal, at least self diagnosed, uh, that um, you know, what's the, there's a phrase for it. Uh, and I, I'm going to butcher it because it's way too early in the morning here, but something like the 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 pull of the the lure of the void or something where you like when you're standing on the edge of a building or you're standing at, standing on it in front of a free fall, and part of your brain goes be like to jump like, like there's that there's like wow like there's that that little tiny voice that goes just do it just find out and uh, hopefully uh the fact that you're listening to the show means you've probably never done that uh but um that that sort of pull i mean you what pulls you back from that is all the things you've got to live for right the, the thing that stops you from acting upon that is 
I, I've got my kids, my wife, my, my parents, whatever it is that's going to that's gonna stop you from yeah, ending your life in that moment over some sort of trivial sort of curiosity. Uh, but um, if you take those things away, if you if you don't have that state that stabilizing force, uh, then you know I've, I've talked to a lot of friends that were suicidal, and they said the one thing that stopped them from from acting upon those suicidal urges was that they didn't want to put that put their parents through that, or they didn't want to put their kids through that, or whatever. But if that was taken away from you, you you lost custody of your children, and all of a sudden you don't, and, and you, there's a narrative being built about you that you're a that you're a terrible father or a terrible mother or whatever. Then all of a sudden that's not a stabilizing force anymore. Um, so those are things I think we all have an obligation to look out for, not to say that anytime someone has a relationship breakdown, we should report them to the police. Uh, but if there's compounding factors, um, look after those people in your life when they're doing those things and make sure they do feel that they're supported and they're, they're still part of something bigger than themselves, even though this one thing has gone wrong. No, you're exactly, I mean, that's a hundred percent correct. And, um, you know, it was one time I was uh, standing post out in uh, San Francisco and um, in the, the shadows of the, uh, the the Golden Gate Bridge. And I was talking to one of the park rangers about, you know, the, the, the jumpers. And um, I said, you know, that's a long way down. And I think we calculated it was about a four second drop from the top to the, you know, when you had impact. I said, you know, that's a long way to contemplate your life and think, wow, gee, I, maybe I made a mistake doing this. And uh, he said that, that, that they've had a number of people that have survived. And of those survivors, they all said that they realized once they had jumped that it was too late, it was a, a mistake. And again, it just, like you said, for those that still have some um, rational thoughts, can reflect on, hey, listen, I don't want to do this because of, you know, my children or my family. But, you know, I've seen it too, where despite the fact that they know that their children are even going to be the ones that find them, that they still commit suicide. And it shows you the, the depth of the despair and the, the darkness that has absolutely consumed them, that they, they can't even uh, uh, manufacture a rational thought like that. Yeah, th those are the ones that have become harder to comprehend from a from a, a sane or or psychologically stable point of view because you're thinking like how how could you do that? Um, but at the same time, if they're in the mindset that uh, this life is worthless, uh, it, like we think about, um, you know, parents that that murder their children uh, before taking their own lives, it's often done from a perspective of I'm saving my child from this world, uh, and and saving yes. the grief of my death by taking them with me is like it's it's such a broken way of looking at the world but these are broken people at this point that are right. contemplating these things um so there's there's a lot of that um we we are we are coming up on time and there's so many things we we could unpack further uh I, I think I'll probably probably just to to round things out if you had an encouragement to anyone who's working in a in a care role in a protection role that uh yeah, we've got a lot of people on 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 our listener base that are running security at schools or at universities or at hospitals. Uh, that that maybe this is this is something they go to work every day, worried about that maybe today will be the day this happens here. What encouragement or advice would you give to those people? So I, I would tell them to you know, um, you know, uh, as the the gift of fear, you know, listen to that inner voice. If you suspect, and especially when you're around somebody like a coworker, especially you're with that person for, you know, essentially eight hours a day, you get to really know somebody and you can see when they're struggling. And the same if you're a school teacher now, it, it was very difficult during COVID because a lot of it was remote learning. So everything was, you know, being done through Zoom. But, you know, when you have in-person classes, you can actually, you know, start to see that, you know, your particular students having trouble. And, and the one thing we saw with the adolescent uh, attackers was that most of them had significant um, um, what we refer to as uh, ACEs, which are uh, adverse childhood experiences, you know, childhood trauma, you know, um, mental, physical, sexual abuse at home, drug abuse, alcohol, uh, criminality, all of that going on in the house. Uh, so the support system is not there. And so, like we said, you know, sometimes it's, we have the opportunity to throw a, a life preserver out to these individuals 
and to see what's going on in their life. And if need be, then we need to report that conduct so it can be uh, acted upon. And hopefully who you're reporting it to will take it seriously and, and actually do their job as well, whether it's human resources or school administrators. And, you know, we've seen sometimes where, you know, threat assessments were not done completely, where, you know, people didn't know how to conduct a threat assessment. And I always urge people, it has to be holistic. You have to interview as many people as you can in that person's uh, life, you know, uh, neighbors, family, friends, uh, fellow students, teachers, uh, coworkers, managers, uh, whoever you can find and uh, doing the appropriate checks as well to see what's going on and to get a, a broad view. And obviously you need to speak to the individual itself to find out, hey, what is going on? And, uh, you know, I've sat in the interview with these people countless times and uh, sometimes, you know, that they attach themselves to me because I was really the only person that was willing to sit there and provide a listening ear to them and uh, that they would call me up. I had one individual call me, you know, it was one time I, uh, turn on my phone in the morning and there's 26 voicemail messages from him. And he was just providing me his, his travel log, but, you know, he looked at me as his, his new buddy, because again, I was willing to, to listen to him. But at the same time, each one of those phone calls was kind of a kettle releasing some of the steam and some of the pressure. And, uh, and I was also able to monitor, you know, what was going on in his life as, as well. Yeah, there's there's so much in that, and uh, look, I really, really appreciate the work you've done, obviously through your through your law enforcement career, but also in in writing the books that you've written, uh, and uh, and and making your time available for this, um, folks. If you if you're out there and you're you're thinking about you need to prepare for this, get educated. There's so much information. There are so many people like Mike that have a ton of experience that are literally giving it away for free. Uh, if you have a Kindle Unlimited account, you can get Mike's book for free. Uh, yes, <laughs> part of your subscription, uh, and I think it's only about ten dollars otherwise. So it's it's, it's uh, if this is something that's keeping you awake at night. Ten dollars to 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 address that might be might be a good spend. Um, but look, if you if you're listening to this show, you know we've had so many people that are that are committed to being able to help you manage these sorts of issues. Um, there's a, there's a ton of information out there. I, I was just thinking about uh, my two interviews with Jim Kaywood that. Uh, you know, Jim's written the the textbooks on threat assessment. You want to know more about threat assessment? Go read those books. Like there, there's so much we can do. And he's done five thousand threat assessment. I was like, oh my gosh, how is that possible? But you know, I, I take him at his word. I, well, he said he stopped counting at five thousand. <laughs> right. That might have been 1986. We don't know. Yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, so look, uh, Mark, thank you very much for your time. I know you're going to stick around and do uh, some bonus questions for us. Uh, but uh, if people want to know more, uh, are you doing speaking? Are you doing any consulting or coaching or anything at the moment? Uh, no, not uh, not lately. Um, I, I did in the previous life, but uh, you know the book is out there. Uh, you can. Um, I'm on LinkedIn under Mike Roach, and then also uh, I have a website, MikeRoach.com, and then. Um, the, the book is available exclusively through Amazon. So like you said, it's free if you're a, uh, 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 what's it called? Uh, Kindle, yeah, Kindle, Unlimited. Uh, Kindle Unlimited. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, no, the Kindle Unlimited has, uh, has got me many, uh, actually many, many poor books, but this is one of the good ones. <laughs> well, I, I was very fortunate too, that uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Dave Grossman, um, you know, reached out to me and said, Hey, has anybody written a forward on this book? I would like to do that. And wow. uh, so he, he wrote the forward and it's very powerful as well. So uh, yeah. I really appreciate it. I was honored to, to have his endorsement. Yeah. Look, and uh, I, I mentioned to you before we started recording that uh, it was actually that endorsement that uh, brought you to my attention Yeah. or uh, um, yeah, Colonel Grossman share, share on LinkedIn about the book. And I thought, Ooh, Dave Grossman's endorsing it. It must be something. And uh, <laughs> I'm really glad he did because it, it is, as, a, as I said to you again, before we started recording, I, I've uh, read a number of these uh, books around this topic over the last couple of years. And uh, and it is a really well-written book. Uh, we didn't mention, we didn't talk about the fiction that you've written previously. Maybe that's a topic for another time. But, right. uh, but 
Yeah, Mark, Mark's a great writer uh, as well as a subject matter expert. So you, you won't go wrong spending your ten bucks or your free Kindle Unlimited subscription to uh, to pick up that book. And, and it's and it's it's not a pamphlet either. <laughs> there's, there's, <laughs> there's some serious work that's got into that. So, uh, all right. Well, that that will do us for the interview. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, if you're a Patreon contributor, make sure you head on over to Patreon and grab the bonus content. Joe, thank you so much. Thank you once again to Mike Roach for a fascinating conversation about a very difficult subject. And uh, don't forget, if you are in the US and if you are heading to the GSX conference in Atlanta, Georgia, September 12 to 14, 2022, make sure you come say hello, check out my session. Uh, let's, uh, let's grab a coffee. Uh, would love to meet as many of you as possible. Atlanta, Georgia, September 12 to 14, and I'll be around for a few days afterwards as well. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll talk to you next time.